go-to shower songs, Death Row Last Meal, Getting on TV, A Writer's Purpose, The Impact of Travel, What's My Type, Who Put the Bump in the Bomb Shabomb Shabomb, and My Defining High School Crush. You brought the cues, so I will bring the A's. Slip on those headphones and smoke them if you got them, son. It's 20 Questions, Part 2, on Buddha and the Slut. She's dead. Wrapped in plastic. Oh, this is a cute one. Vera Chuck asks, what's your type? What's your go-to shower song? And what's your death row last meal? Okay. I'm going to answer these in reverse. My death row last meal, I'm sorry, vegetarians, but it's going to be a beautiful medium rare rack of lamb with like roasted garlic mashed potatoes with a bit of like shaved Parmesan in the potatoes themselves and some chives. There's going to be a massive piece of uh, brown sugar crusted cinnamon and tart apple pie with a big wedge of cheddar cheese and real vanilla bean ice cream. I think that's a good start. Of course, a beautiful bottle of wine. Depends on the year, depends upon the mood, but it'll be something inoffensive and something that would let the lamb just sing with its rosemary and mint reduction on the lamb. That would be my death row last meal. And maybe some fried chicken. And maybe a chocolate lava cake. And maybe some pumpkin cheesecake from Calories in Saskatoon. And maybe some poutine from Montreal. And a shaved meat sandwich. And maybe some Indian from London. Uh, Maybe some sushi from Vancouver. Maybe some, oh my gosh, maybe some macaroons and pastries from Paris. And some croissants and pain chocolat. And okay, this is getting obscene now. And it's violent. I'm going to die from the food. And that's the whole point. I want to die from the food and not from whatever method of execution has been chosen. So that's my death row last meal. It's everything good and tasty from around the world. Your go-to shower song. Here's a funny thing, and this is how lame I am. I have hinted in the past that, in the first episode of this, in fact, and uh, on my website, and definitely on my YouTube page, that's youtube.com slash broken saint, where I do a, a slam poem called You Were There, all about my TV addiction. The songs I tend to sing when I'm driving around the island with headphones on or even in the shower are TV themes. I still do that, especially old school, like 70s TV themes. I'm not talking like thunder, 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 kiss me. I'm talking about, you know, classics, right? Like, oh, the way Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. (laughs) <laughs> like all in the family or good times anytime you need a payment good times anytime you're feeling free good times anytime you're out from under not getting hassled not getting hustled keeping your head above water making a way when you can a temporary layoffs good time easy slamming ripoffs good times scratching and surviving good times hanging in a job line good times ain't we lucky we got home ba 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 Bum, good time. Yeah. All the Norman Lear stuff. I love that stuff. Moving on up, moving on up to this. So I will be, this is embarrassing. I will be in the shower and suddenly I will hear some cheesy line. Something will remind me of some cheesy TV show I used to be obsessed with or I just have on in the background while I was doing homework when I was a kid. That's the stuff that sticks in my head. Sadly, it's embarrassing now. Last but not least, you ask, what's your type? Breathing's good. (laughs) Uh, Smart. Not as smart as me, because, you know, then I feel threatened. (laughs) But smart, for sure. Conversation is so essential for me. The older I get, the more I want to be able to engage with words on multiple subjects. I want to feel like I am heard and understood, uh, listened to, but also I want to really be intrigued by. I want to sit there and be commanded by your presence and to have you regale me with tales too. That's my feminine side coming out. I love that. So uh, intelligent, witty, funny. Sensual. I think sensual and sexy for me is better than pretty. You know, I don't need the, the you know, the 9.5, the 10 that's like stamped out in some factory in Tampa somewhere. I, I don't need that Barbie doll thing at all. 
Um, I would much rather have someone who carries themselves with a type of sensuality and how they speak and how they walk and how their lips move and how their nostrils flare and how their eyes just start to smolder, how their hips sway when they take their long strides. If you know the Swedish study about that, you'll know why I like it. Um, yeah, a little bit of curve, a little bit of pout, a little bit of nostril flare, a little bit of raised eyebrow, some hip, a little bit of bosom, not too much. Definitely some ass, because I'm an ass man. A girl who knows how to walk. And a girl who knows her way around a good 69. There you go. Ho, that's what I like. That's my type. I can do anything I want. So can you. Ah, another writing one, I think. This is A.H. Amin. Hello, brother. A writer goes through self-torturing trials. I just spoke of those to share something important. I believe you have proven yourself to be up to the challenge more than 10 years ago with Broken Saints. For those of you who haven't seen my motion comic epic, you can go to brokensaints.com or look up Broken Saints on Amazon. It was a pretty cool thing. 10-hour motion comic, four-disc DVD set, and an original Flash series. Huzzah! Cyber spirituality awesome thriller tech horror thing continue with this question now with today's online media like netflix and hulu among others and the rise of independent studios do you have plans to carry your ideas to a new level in storytelling oh there's a part two and a part three to this question uh, part two, he's asking, we see you travel a lot lately during which you share about spirituality, life, locations, people, martial arts, cats, and food from many cultures. What inspired you to start that journey? And in what way did it affect you? Wow. And part three, what do you believe a writer and storyteller's purpose are? Purposes are. What do you believe a writer and storyteller's purposes are? Okay, you asked three things. I give you three quick answers. Number one, you asked, do you have plans to carry your ideas to a new level in storytelling? I would love to. I need an agent. Uh, you need an agent or producing partners to be able to take your stories and move them into different media now. It's it's not as easy as just, oh, I'm going to make a bit of a web series now or a YouTube series now and hope someone picks it up. It's a challenging, cutthroat, competitive business. Now, there are more channels now, especially on cable. Uh, uh, there are streaming channels. Uh, so many services popping up, and I think that the opportunities will present themselves. Um, but you need to build a portfolio of original IP as well as work on things that are known. So that that is part of my strategy now, to continue to do game writing and game consultations and interactive media consultations that could hopefully kind of raise my profile a bit and get me back in the hunt uh, with a more responsible uh, uh, outlook now, uh, as well as doing original IP and original projects and independent stuff. That could potentially get some shine, be they books, um, audio projects like this one. So yeah, that was your first question. That's I do want to be involved in that world, but it's all about timing and the right projects and the right partners. Part two, you see you travel a lot lately. Uh, what inspired you, to, inspired you to start the journey? I don't need to give you a long answer here. You need to listen to episode one of this podcast. It's called Peaks and Geeks. I tell a 25-minute story from the heart, a little lyrical, quite revealing, and occasionally even funny about why I started traveling. So Peaks and Geeks, episode one of Buddha and the Slut. Give it a listen. What do you believe a writer and storyteller's purposes are? To be a mirror to readers, to the world. When you tell stories, you are holding up a mirror to people to make them go, oh, wait, that's me. I understand something about that, which helps me understand something about myself that I didn't understand before I experienced this story. That is your job to remind human beings, your fellow human beings of the human condition, of what the world really is, to pull back someone's curtain of ignorance, uh, to, to wake them up, to snap them awake, and to maybe, hopefully, not just entertain, but, uh, but relieve some suffering along the way. That's what I think a storyteller's purpose is. Thank you for asking that question. Because you're so thick. You're Mr. Thick, thick, thickety, thick face from Thick Town, Thickania. And so's your dad. Okay, a uh, fun little one. Mr. Hetley asks, who put the bop in the bop shabop shabop? Uh, that's very clever of you, Mr. Hetley. So basically, if you don't know this phrase from, is it the 50s? Uh, what's his name? Barry Mann 
saying, you know, who put the bump in the bomb sha bomb sha bomb? Who put the ram in the ram a lam a ding dong? Who put the bop in the bop shoe bop shoe bop? Who put the dip in the dip the dip the dip? Who was that man? I'd like to shake his hand. He made my baby fall in love with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hope that was entertaining. So you're asking, who put the bop in the bop shabop shabop? We could be philosophical about it and be like, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Who did put the bop in the bop shabop shabop? Well, no matter who created the bop shabop shabop, someone created that man or woman who put the bop in the bop shabop shabop. Someone created them, higher, higher, so on and so on and so on, infinite turtles up until we reach the divine creator who is the one who put the bop in the bop shabop shabop. Or... That's the divine answer. That's the Buddha answer. Now, for this podcast, we need the other side. So for the slut answer, for the profane answer, um, basically, the song is about a dude who's asking, okay, which of you Elvis motherfuckers out there turned my girlfriend on enough with your music that makes her want to bone me? I want to thank you for that. Who put the bop in the bop shabop shabop? I want to shake that man's hand that made that baby fall in love with me. Basically... This is like 16, 17-year-old kid who got laid up at Inspiration Point in the back of his dad's station wagon, and he's thanking the singer on the radio, most likely Elvis or the Beatles or someone similar, for making his girl feel so much emotion and so much anxiousness and, and uh, tension and, and you know, sexual chemistry and excitement that it let him get laid. So there's your answer. The famous singer who turned your girl on and God put the bop in the bop shoe bop shoe bop. Well, I'm not saying that I've been everywhere and I've done everything. But I do know it's a pretty amazing planet we live on here. Unruly Julie. I like that. Uh, I I think from now now on, from here forth, forthwith, that my kingdom decrees that all Julies shall be unruly Julies. I like that. It makes them sound a little bit dangerous, doesn't it? Unruly Julie, I will answer your question. Matsuo Basho once said that every day is a journey, and the journey itself is home. Does being a nomad make you a stronger writer, and would you be a different author if you didn't travel? Julie, thanks for the question. I think that it ties very much so uh, into the question that was asked earlier about psychedelics, and that yes, you are expanding your horizons and perceptions by traveling. This show is going to be a bit about the digital nomad experience because I have been for five, six years now just living out of a backpack. I sold my stuff. I don't have a fixed address. I have a friend back in Canada who gets my mail. But otherwise, and I pay my taxes. I just paid my taxes. Woo! I get gigs and I work on them remotely and I travel. And there is an addictive quality to it because the experience of traveling, like the experience of psychedelic drugs, opens up your perceptions to different ways of being and different ways of living. And you learn so much about yourself in the highs and yes, in the lows. When you're trapped in horrible, like, you know, I was facing a a hurricane on a tiny island in Belize and I thought I was going to die. I've had you know, cops and drug lords. I've been stuck nearby horrible situations here in Southeast Asia. Um, I've had a knife pulled on me. I've had crazy things happen where I would follow a girl home drunk and then, you know, you think you're going to get robbed or a boyfriend's there and he's threatening to fight you and you're like, I'm in the middle of nowhere and if I fight you, I'm going to end up in jail or worse. You get sick. I've gotten horribly sick traveling uh, to the point where I honestly thought I was going to die and the last thing I did was press send on a file for a book I was working on because I thought, okay, at least this will live on if I don't. That's fucked up. But it really makes you change your priorities. It opens up your perceptions. It changes the way you see the world. And so as you continue to write, you see that what's coming out of you is so much different from what came out of you before you traveled, before you were changed by the experience. So I don't know what kind of author I would be if I hadn't traveled. I think I would probably do what a lot of creatives do, which is just copy what they know. You know, I used to teach at a, a school for design, uh, for narratives, for, for game design, narrative design, storytelling, film, public speaking. And I used to get frustrated with my students because they would always be like, oh yeah, I've got the story. It's like, it's like uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. And I would say, well, how about you first read the Lord of the Rings books and read other Tolkien? Um, but how about you also go and track down the old Norse myths and the Finnish myths? How about you read, you know, Joseph Campbell? How about you get into Jungian archetypes? How about you go back to the original stories? 
and even better, take the framework of those original stories, plump them in your head, you know, download them into your brain, and then go travel and have your life experiences through the prisms and lenses and filters of those stories, and then write something. So yeah, I think that without the experience of life or changed perceptions, uh, you can be very stuck uh, in just kind of aping what you've consumed. I've been guilty of it. You know, Half of Broken Saints was an homage to like, you know, Watchmen and Sandman and other stuff I had consumed. But part of it was based on my limited travels at the time to the South Pacific and also some of my work experiences. The more you expand your consciousness and your perception of the world around you and your senses and your intuition, I think the deeper your work will be. Uh, no time for the old in and out, love. I've just come to read the meter. In the grand design, women were drawn from a different set of blueprints. Oh my goodness, it's another Julie. I will skip your last name, Julie, and just say Julie number two, or as I so decreed a moment ago, Unruly Julie the second. Unruly Julie the second asks, which high school crush had the most impact and influence in your life and endeavors and how slash why? That at least narrows it down to one crush, I hope. I don't know whether to make this a long or a short story, because I am certainly babbling a lot, but this is an interesting one, and it might be an important one. But let's just say, I think that there were two. There were two, and they might not be what you would expect. These were not girls I technically dated. The first were a pair of sisters, a couple of years apart. I came to high school a super geek. I had skipped grades. I was in like the advanced stream. Um, I was this nerdy, sensitive, I'd mentioned in podcast one, this artistic, you know, let's do musicals. Let's play these games. Let's dress up in costumes. Let's express our feelings. And I lived in a hockey town and that, that, that caught me a couple of beatings. And it got, it got pretty overwhelming for me. It got, it got to the point where I was terrified to come into school. And one of the few places other than the classroom where I felt safe was in the old gymnasium at Sutton District High School, where that was what I attended for my secondary education. And uh, in the old gymnasium, every lunchtime, they, we set up the volleyball nets and we played volleyball over three courts. And I loved volleyball because it was the only sport I even had a, a smidgen of proficiency in. And that's where, you know, there were some, some of the cool kids were there because volleyball was still the cool sport when I first came to high school before it became basketball and, and baseball. But um, in that gym, I kind of like, I was able to prove myself just a little bit that I came in every day, even if I sucked, even if the big kids picked on me, even if I would leave crying, I'd come back the next day and try to get better. And I think that eventually caught the attention of this pair of sisters. I think you know who you are. There's an old biblical tale, Blank and Abel. So Blank Sisters, <laughs> I just gave it away, but Blank Sisters, you had a huge impact on me. The older of the two, which is very kind, um, she was super cool, you know, student council and had some swagger and didn't try to like, you know, throw her weight around, had no massive ego, was kind to everyone and I noticed it, but she was really kind to me. And when she saw some of the, the cool guys and the tough guys and the hockey boys and whatever picking on me. She'd be like, yeah, he's nice, leave him alone, which sometimes made it worse. But I saw her take some guys aside and say, be nice. And then, you know, the next day they'd let me play on their team or something. They were trying to get in her good side because she really had this strong kind of loving matriarchal vibe. She was like a teacher. She was older, but she was much cooler and super cute. And that leads to her younger sister, who was also a few years ahead of me. And the younger sister, uh, the following year, I had really jumped forward in my mathematics classes. This was still when I was a math prodigy, kind of. And uh, I think it was a senior algebra class. And I was in grade nine the next year. And she was in, I think, grade 11 or 12. And her older sister had kind of been like, hey, you know, watch out for my younger sister. If you can help her, that's great. I hear you're in her class. And... I understood even at that young age was a bit of a quid pro quo sort of thing, but I really liked her younger sister too. Super cute, a little bit more badass, a little bit more sassy, you know, a little bit more stare at you, like, you know, chewing on her pencil, look around the room and kind of give the guys the eye and put them in their place too. She had a sharp sense of humor. And yeah, I was able to help. I had patience and she was always being sweet and I knew the game. She would flirt with me and then ask for help or occasionally like, you know, look over at my answers on an exam or something. And I understood she wasn't being... She wasn't being overt about it, and she wasn't being mean about it, and she would always be really, really sweet. And even when she would give me a little hug and she'd get razzed by the cool guys for doing it, oh, don't touch him, you're going to get AIDS, like something stupid like that from my small town, she'd be like, oh, well, and hug me more and give me a little kiss on the cheek. And it was super sweet. And it was the following year 
when I was still struggling with being bullied so much and just not feeling like I fit in and, you know, of course, going through my teen angst and rebellion uh, with my parents, there was, uh, was it a school play or was it a, I think it was a Christmas presentation. It was a few years later, actually. And it was like a, a, a Christmas show that the seniors put on and I volunteered to help them and I helped them with writing it and uh, did a little musical number in it. And it actually, you know, the whole school, of course, shows up for these shows. And, and I really felt like I was part of something. It was fun. And um, everyone in the show seemed to really appreciate it. And the audience laughed a lot. And the teachers loved it. And then we had all planned on going to this house party. It was one of the first house parties I ever went to. We went to this house party out in the boonies in Keswick. And um, we're all sitting there. And I, I wasn't old enough to buy booze. But, but this girl, the younger sister, was almost old enough. I said, I'll get you some. No problem. Don't worry about it. You were great in the show. And back then you got like, the two things you got were beer and peach schnapps. That is a recipe for disaster. (laughs) Think about that for a second. Cheap Canadian beer and peach schnapps. Oh man, I can still feel the hangover today. But as we're sitting there and the whole senior class, it's like grade 12s and 13s back then. That was, you know, before that moved on to university. This was Ontario. We're all sitting there, like 30, 40 people at this big house party. It's totally new for me, and I was kind of nervous, and I was younger than everybody else, but I helped them with the show, and they were all being super nice because the show turned out well, so people are bringing me over beers or making me do shots. I'm kind of like, I'm a novelty at the party at this point. You know, funny, do a story, Brooke, sing that song again, ha, 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 look what we made him do, ha, ha, ha. But a few drinks in, I start speaking to the, the younger sister. And we're talking, getting closer and closer and closer and laughing more and then kind of like, you know, being touchy and silly. And you could feel the electricity in the room and the room kind of goes quiet and we're getting closer and closer. And then she just like puts her hand on my face and pulls me in and we kiss. And I didn't suck. I can tell you that. Well, unless she stuck out her tongue and then I did because I thought she liked it. But I didn't suck. And you heard the room go, oh. And I think at that moment, the reason, you know, what that girl, what that cool chick, the cool younger sister of the ultra cool chick, the family, the blank and Abel's did for me was pull me out of this pit of social despair and, and being ostracized and feeling like I wasn't good enough, strong enough, typically manly enough, whatever. And by kissing me, it was like knighting me. It was like anointing me. And it wasn't just a peck. This was like long makeouts to the point where people were just like, Jesus, you two get a room. But they were speaking to me like an equal from that point onwards, at least for a while. And you know, I think I've answered that question. I'm not going to tell you about the other crush. I'm going to save that for a podcast story because it's interesting, but it's also grim. I do believe that we can learn the biggest lessons through adversity. And this other quote, crush, unquote, almost cost me my life. It was another high school one, and uh, it was filled with sadness and despair and fear and anger and angst and emptied bank accounts and bodyguards. And uh, (laughs) it's funny now. (laughs) It's funny now. I'll just give you like a code name for the story so you remember for a future podcast. The code name is Kelly Bundy. And that's all you need to know about that. Thank you, Unruly Julie, too, for your question about high school crushes. Tune in tomorrow. Same cat time, same cat channel. That's all for now, kittens and cats. Keep the questions coming and I'll keep giving it to you raw. If you dug this episode and enjoyed the first six, please take a few minutes to rate the show and post a review on Google Play, Stitcher, and especially iTunes, as we want to land that coveted new and notable slot. Next time, it's an in-depth chat about creative origins, masculinity, drugs, and David goddamn Bowie with cult author, philosopher, sex magician, and psychedelic journeyman, James Curcio. Until then, keep it real, my friends, and don't finger the bean dip.